Thank you for listening to the Conform to Christ podcast, where we seek to engage the mind, affect the heart, and call people to follow Christ. I'm Jay Jones, and I am here with George Mays on a Text Driven Tuesday. Here we are. And it is time to start a new Text Driven Tuesday series on the book of Hebrews. Yeah. So you've been waiting a pretty good while for this one, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, people came up and were uh, talking about how beneficial it was, and I said, uh, that's what happens when I've been working on a sermon for three months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you started this sermon kind of out in your intro talking about um, this is your favorite book. Yeah. So we won't spend a ton of time, but how, how did it become your favorite book? Like, how did that process happen, and why? Why do you think it did? The process? Yeah, because you know, like, one day, one day it wasn't your favorite book, right. and then one day it was. Um, I think as I started um, studying biblical theology, mm-hmm. um, especially in seminary. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Because people that are listening, probably, right. they probably just think all theology is biblical theology if it comes out of the Bible. Right. Um, biblical theology is in, um, I guess, contrast to systematic theology. So uh-huh. systematic theology is taking every verse, every passage about a, a particular topic yeah. and saying, what does the Bible say about this topic? Right. Right. So um, in Sunday school, we've been doing the doctrine of sin. Mm-hmm. So we're just taking passages from all over the place and what does the Bible say about sin? Mm-hmm. And that's systematic theology. Yeah. Um, biblical theology is um, letting the storyline of Scripture unfold. Yeah. And and how does the Bible present um, doctrine as it unfolds from yeah. Genesis to Revelation? Mm-hmm. So it's uh, what's so frustrating about biblical theology is how long it took me to understand it. To sort of get it, um, because I have an English degree mm-hmm. um, from from college and uh, a, a literature degree, and uh, so what. How do you read a book? Mm-hmm. You start at the beginning, yeah, and you let the story unfold, <laughs> and you see how the how the themes are developed and how the characters move and the plot um, moves from conflict to resolution. And um, it wasn't until goodness, it probably wasn't until four or five years after I, I graduated that I suddenly realized you can read the Bible that way too. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, you don't just open the Bible to a random spot and just read a verse out of context. You mm. start at the beginning and you read to the end, and uh, the the Bible unfolds the same way that a good a good story unfolds. Right. There's a reason for that, right? Mm. Every good story is is just a shadow of the ultimate story that we're all living in. Yeah. And so God has he we have a beginning. And we have themes that start to develop, mm. and uh, one of those themes is the coming of the Messiah. Mm-hmm. Like, that is the storyline of of the Bible. Yeah, Genesis three fifteen. You have the 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 seed of the woman who is is said he's coming, and he's going to restore everything that was corrupted by the fall. Mm-hmm. And then as you go through the book, um, the the theme starts to expand, and you get more and more, you know, clues, more mm-hmm. hints. Yeah. Um, as to who this this <clears throat> Messiah is, and then you know Matthew chapter one, and you've got the genealogy that goes from from Abraham to Jesus, and here he is, yeah, here, here he is, um, and then you know the rest of the the Bible is expanding on who who this is, yeah. who is this Messiah, and then of course it culminates in Revelation with uh, the the King coming and uh, the the kingdom consummating mm. with his his reign his forever reign um and so as i as i started to understand biblical theology more I, and coming to hebrews it is a book that it's biblical theology mm-hmm. the author of hebrews is he is seeing how these themes have been developed from the old testament to the new testament from um the the types and shadows these um kind of anticipatory symbols <clears throat> Persons, places, events, um, institutions—how they are—they're foreshadowing 
again, like a mm-hmm. good a good book. You've got foreshadowing. It foreshadows in the in the Old Testament, and then it culminates in the New Testament. And the author of Hebrews is showing how it, how all of these these foreshadows in the Old Testament culminate in the person of Christ. And in, and as you read it, it's just such a marvelous book, um, and it just encapsulates the whole story. Mm-hmm. I mean, if if I was if I was stranded on a you know a desert island, and I could only have one book out of the Bible, I would want Hebrews because it tells me the whole story. Mm-hmm. Like it reminds me of Genesis. It reminds me of Exodus. It, it tells me the, the whole story um, and how it culminates in Christ. And so I, that's, I guess that's, that's why Hebrews is um, really my favorite book because mm-hmm. it, it contains all the other books. Yeah. But what if you didn't have all the other books and all you had was Hebrews? I think it's still, it's still there. But yeah, but it would be difficult. It would be difficult because you'd be yeah. you'd have none of the background, right? Yeah, it'd be if like you, watching, if you just had the book of Hebrews. It's like watching Star Wars in the correct order, right? <laughs> right. You're like what is going on? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying to the exclusion of the other books, right? You know, you got to have that background info though. You're gonna you do, get much yeah. more out of Hebrews if you read, right? If you've read the rest of the Bible, and, and I love I love how the author he he he's just gonna draw from Old Testament. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't go a page without him right. quoting from the Old Testament. So yeah, you need that. Yeah. Um, but if you only had the book of Hebrews, you still could yeah, see you, could you still, still could it. see it. You, you could still, still see could the see supremacy. Uh huh. Yeah, of, of the points being made. Right. Right. For sure. Okay. Well, let's 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 ask this question then. Um, the writing of the book of Hebrews. Yeah, who's, right. who's the author? <laughs> All right. Who wrote this? Yeah. Who wrote this great book? I don't know. Do you know? You got it all figured out. I, I, at one time, I'll tell you this story. You'll kind of get a kick out of this. So I, I, I was teaching Sunday school. This is before I ever went to seminary. I was teaching, uh, and we were going through Hebrews. And there's this guy that had, he's kind of a newer guy uh, to the church, and he came to the Sunday school class. He, paired to, he, he really liked it a lot, you know? And apparently I had like a slip, and I said that Paul, the uh-huh. author Paul right. of Hebrews or whatever, you know, as just as, as I was teaching uh-huh, through yeah. without even thinking of it. It right. just came out. And uh, he he was real offended by it. Really? Oh yeah, a- enough so that he left my Sunday school class and never came back. What? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's maybe uh, moving the the importance of the, right. the author up to a first tier yeah, issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he, I mean, I, he came to me and said, "You don't know that Paul wrote it." And I was right. Like, oh, I mean, you're right. I don't. I just you know I just said it. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that it probably did, but. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sorry for my Freudian slip, <laughs> but that you know that's not. People, yeah, people can I, be weird though, man. Right? Yeah. yeah, they get mad about certain things and leave. Pretty ridiculous. Actually. Right. Um. So there's a there's a long list of, of possible candidates that have been put forward. Yeah. Um. Paul is is one of the oldest mm-hmm. um candidates. Um. But even he wasn't universally acknowledged as the author. Mm-hmm. Um, in the early church, it wasn't until um, like Augustine and Jerome they really they really put forward as Paul did write it, right. and the Western Church mm-hmm. um, adopted that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Eastern Church didn't. So you, you see that that even in the you know the, the first several centuries, it wasn't unanimous that it was Paul. Um, so one ter- thing that ter- might be interesting is. For people to understand why we don't know, yeah, is that the te- uh, so these these are written on scrolls, mm-hmm. and there is a tag usually attached to that with the title, and then maybe also the author, right? And a lot of times, as in transport, the tag would get ripped off and then fall off. Yeah. So apparently, in God's providence, He did not preserve any tags, right? So we have no idea who wrote. Yeah, and uh, this is Hebrews is a it's an interesting book because it it's kind of presented like a sermon, mm-hmm. but it's also a letter. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't have some of the um, some of the the characteristics of a letter. So there's no there's no introduction. The mm-hmm. the author just jumps right in to to what his message is. There's no there's no Paul to the church at. Does anyone? Since you've done all this research, anybody think this was one of Peter's sermons? You know, I I didn't run across that in any of my commentaries. I had I had one of our members come up on Sunday after the sermon and ask me, like, 
you didn't mention Peter. Uh-huh. So I didn't I didn't run across that. I just wondered if you know was uh, an Anna 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 Musius. How do you say that word? Yeah. So and a new, someone yeah. who a professional writer, right? If, a sec- if, like a secretary. Like if the church had hired someone right. to write, like Pete, one of Peter's famous sermons, right? Because it could be someone could stand up and preach this openly, right? Um, and someone could write it. Yeah, I didn't run across Peter as one of the options, but one of the options is that it's it's Pauline in its origin, but Luke wrote it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, which that, that's a really. Um, that's a, a really interesting um, option because mm-hmm. you know you read through the book of Acts and Luke was one of, of Paul's closest companions. Right, he would have heard. And they were together. And he traveled would, they, some. they were together a lot. Um, he would have heard Paul preaching, and uh, so and he, Paul, could have, he could have written this down, and then he could have sent this out uh, from himself. Paul often would go to the synagogues first mm-hmm. and argue from the scriptures, right, for the supremacy of Jesus, like who he was, right. So, yeah, um, another uh, another really attractive option is one that was put forward like by um, by Tertullian, who is an early church father, and he uh, he suggested Barnabas. Mm-hmm. And the reason why he suggested Barnabas is kind of twofold. One, Barnabas was a Levite. If you go back to to Acts chapter six, where he's introduced, mm. he's uh, or the end of chapter five, um, he's he's a Levite, and uh, the Levitical theology is very heavy. it's front it's front and center in the book right? Jesus is better than the the Levit- Levitical priest he's better than the the temple sacrifices um it, it even seems I think it's in chapter nine he starts describing the uh kind of the the um the things that are in the tabernacle mm-hmm. and he starts listing them and he, it's almost as if he has to forcefully stop himself from going on we don't have time to to go into all of this right um, and so it's it's someone who's very intimately acquainted with um, the Levitical system. Hmm. Now, Paul, as a, as a Pharisee, he would have been um, he would have been very acquainted with this. Yeah. Uh, but the Barnabas option is is also really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, he also traveled around with Paul. Yeah. Um, and you have to assume that he he taught also. And so. Uh, be interesting if if uh, you know Barnabas wrote it. We don't we don't know what Barnabas's teaching style was like, but if he's traveling around with Paul, you would think that maybe their teaching would would maybe line up, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Luther and Calvin they both rejected the Pauline authorship. Uh, you said something about uh, Luther rejected it for uh, was it cha- uh, chapter two verse five? You go to chapter two verse three. Verse three, okay. Um, and it, this was Luther and Calvin. They both rejected it on on grounds of of verse three. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. So this seems to be a. a Second generation right. Christian. So not Paul. Paul, if you read through his letters, he always says he was an eyewitness. Right. I mean, Galatians, Galatians chapter one, he goes to great lengths to say, "I didn't receive this from man. I received this directly from the Lord." So it would be interesting if Paul was saying, "I received this from those who heard," because so, he's an eyewitness. He heard. He says he heard it from the Lord Himself. So this would be this would make a stronger case for than like. Luke or Mm -hmm. Barnabas. Barnabas, yeah. Uh Mm. Um, And then at the end, um, at the end of the book, he there's not really a traditional. Apollo. Apollos is another option. Um, He was first set forward by Luther. Luther did. Luther's the the first one that Apollos has been recorded as Apollos uh... because you look in in. Acts, where Maybe Apollos so. is introduced, and he's he's skilled with the Old Testament scriptures. He's he's proving that yeah. Jesus is the Messiah from the Old Testament and, scriptures, and he's a skilled orator. Mm-hmm. And this, if it's a sermon, mm-hmm. is put together, composed right. in a very nice way. Uh huh. Right. So yeah. maybe maybe some strength there to that. Um, to that it, Apollos when you sermon. when you get to uh, the end of the book, there's only a very short um, closing greeting, mm-hmm. which again. Not quite like Paul. Paul usually has a list of people that, mm. that he greets. But uh, verse 23 says, um, you should know that our brother Timothy has been released. So he's familiar with Timothy, mm. but he calls Timothy our brother. And Paul my calls son. Timothy my son. Yeah. So again, um, interesting if, um, I, I mean, 
ultimately we're going to have to go with uh, what the the early church father origin said who wrote who the book only god knows yeah only god knows i like what uh, you can what... Be, you can give the nerdy uh the nerdy christian sunday school answer the holy spirit wrote it that's right <laughs> <laughs> which of yeah. course I'm, I'm of course making a joke but right that's the of ultimate course. the ultimate author is god um I like what uh, what Tom Schreiner says in his commentary. He said, um, "All the theories are guesses." Yeah, that's good. So, um, I've got my kind of leaning. Mm-hmm. Um, Tell me, George. Tell it to me. The theology's Paul. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at Paul's Paul's writings. It's there's nothing that would be different from mm-hmm. from Paul. Um, I I favor the Luke, the Luke option, mm-hmm. or the Barnabas one is really attractive. Also, um, those two would be probably the ones that I would Luke writing something that Paul preached that Paul preached. Interesting, yeah. yeah. So, but uh, it's just a guess. Yeah, I mean, in, anyone that says this was one hundred percent written by Paul or you know by anyone else, they're just guessing, mm-hmm. like walking out of a <laughs> Sunday school class, that's maybe escalating it. Uh, that's where I draw a, the line right there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can say <laughs> all kinds of things, but if you tell me that Paul wrote it, I'm never <laughs> coming back. Uh, Calvin, he also said that maybe Clement of Rome mm. wrote it, which I, I think is is it's interesting as we think about church history. Clement of Rome, he was um, a pastor in the Roman church, and he was writing late nineties, mid mm-hmm. mid to late nineties. So not long after you know the the apostles have died, maybe John, uh, maybe the maybe only one around. John may still be a, around. Um, he may have even known Paul. I mean, there's he could have he could have known Paul from when Paul was was in Rome. Um, he wrote the the letter of, of First Clement, mm-hmm. which is a really good. It, it was some some even included it. Um, in scripture, I don't think it was. It wasn't widespread. Um, he wasn't an apostle, uh, but he was very familiar with the Book of Hebrews. He quotes he quotes extensively from the Book of Hebrews. Mm. Um, so a lot of people are saying, "Well, he he quoted from it because he wrote it." <laughs> now I think that um, it was more likely that uh, that the letter was written to the church in Rome, and uh, so he knew it. Uh. Um, but. That was that was one of Calvin's options. Okay. He, he was he was uh, a Clement of Rome or Luke were his uh, his primary ones. Okay. So, but again, they're all guesses. Mm-hmm. It's fun to talk about. I mean, it's fun to right make get you looking at the book and and saying, all right, uh, what you know what what are the strengths for this argument? What are the weaknesses? And it's it's fun, but in the end, um, if God had wanted us to know, we would know. Right. If it was if it was so vitally important that we know who wrote it, then the spirit would have ensured that we had that. Mm-hmm. But obviously, it's not um, it's not of primary importance mm. who wrote it. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay. So now let's talk about the purpose of why 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 is it recorded? Why was it spoken or written initially, and why is it so important that we have it? Yeah. What's the purpose? Well, the the purpose you can see it um, throughout the book, but you really get it when you uh, when you come to chapter ten, and um, this is there's there's kind of a shift uh, from chapter ten to chapter eleven, and so at the end of chapter ten we have um, the author saying, "But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward." For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Okay. I think this really highlights, and I think he's he's escalated to this. This is uh, a warning passage, and we'll talk about the warning passages as we go through the book. Um, th- he's writing to Christians who ha- who are suffering mm-hmm. um, intense persecution. 
they're they're being thrown into jail. So what? So this might play into time. Let's ask that question. Yeah, yeah. When did this type of stuff start to happen? Well, I mean, you see the you see the Book of Acts. Mm-hmm. I mean, read the Book of Acts. It happened almost immediately, mm-hmm. right? Um, especially after the the death of Stephen, um, the persecution from the the Jewish the Jewish religious leaders was kind of exploded, mm-hmm. right? Um, but uh, so. Christianity was originally seen as kind of a sect of Judaism. Yeah. And Judaism was a legal religion by for the, the, by by the, the Roman, Romans. Roman authorities. Yeah. So you could you could legally practice Judaism. They wouldn't encroach upon your your worship. And well, you, they you, would, but not in a, you know, in a, a full And not style. and not just in uh Jerusalem or Right. In, you could practice it in, in the Judea, Roman yeah. in the Roman Empire. Yeah. It was legal. Mm-hmm. Um, and Christianity was originally considered a, a sect of Judaism, uh, but as as the the Jews um, started persecuting the Christians more, and they started expelling them from the synagogue, um, the Christians started to be viewed as not the they're not right. the same. Yeah. So they're now they're being exposed um, as a new religion. That's not protected yeah. uh, by Roman law. So this is an illegal religion. So they're they're persecuted um, primarily in the Book of Acts by the Jews, mm-hmm. but you see it as it's progressing, as as the history is progressing, that they start to be persecuted more and more by the Romans. Yeah. So now you've got kind of this two pronged attack. You're you're persecuted by the Jews, who are expelling you from the synagogue, and if you're Jewish. Um, you are even being ostracized from your family. Yes. But now you're also going to start being persecuted by the Romans. Um, and if you don't offer, you know, a pinch of, of incense to Caesar, then you're going to be mm-hmm. labeled an outlaw. Yeah. And so you can be imprisoned. Um, you can have your property confiscated. Um, you're going to be ostracized from, you know, you, you can't find work because you're, you can't be a part of, of one of the guilds, one of the work guilds, mm-hmm. uh, because part of their, their practice is to worship at, at, uh, you know, pagan temples. Um, and so that, that's what's going on. Um, you've got the, the persecution of these Christians by the Jews and from the Romans. And, uh, so there's going to be this, this big temptation to go back, to go back to um, Judaism. Um, one, you can escape the persecution from the Romans because now you're going back to a legal religion. Two, you're not going to be persecuted by the Jews anymore mm-hmm. because you're you're going back to the acceptable practices. Um, and then three, I think um, even even deeper, like to the heart of what's going on, um, the the. Temple sacrifices are very tangible. Mm-hmm. So you can actually go to a place and you can actually bring like an animal sacrifice and you can see the priest kill this animal and sprinkle the blood on the altar. And you can go away saying, I, I know that my sins have been forgiven because I saw it happen. Um, Christianity is, it's not going to have that, um, you know, the, that physical element to it. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, there's no, there's no central temple. Right. There's no, there's no central place you go. Um, we are professing by faith that Christ, by his death on the cross, atoned for our sin. Mm-hmm. We are, are believing the eyewitness testimonies that said Jesus rose from the dead, but I never saw it. Mm-hmm. Right? So we have to believe. We have to believe things that we don't see, Right. And Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still, there's going to be that temptation. I can see this. I can't see this. Mm-hmm. Um, this comes with persecution. Um, this, all that goes away. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you can see this temptation to, to leave the church and go back to what you've, you've mm-hmm. already known, what your family knows, what culturally is acceptable. What's culturally acceptable? Yeah, that's and, a, that's a huge portion I think. Yeah, that will carry over as we go through this uh, sermon series. Over the I don't know how long it'll take, probably a while. But what's culturally acceptable? Mm-hmm. People people should let that ring in their head for a long time. Right. That's what they're going back. They're going back because yeah. it's costing them. Right. Yeah. So I mean, in a way, these are the first deconstructionists. Yeah, that's Let's right. Let's use some modern. Yeah. 
lingo. Deconstructionism is nothing new. Right. People have been doing it forever. Yeah. Um, and so the, uh, the 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 biblical term is apostasy. Yeah. Right. They're leaving. They're falling away. They're going away. And so the message, the central message of Hebrews, is don't fall away. Yeah. Don't apostatize. Yeah. Right. And um, the the book is it's structured around five warning passages, uh-huh. and all of those warning passages have one common element: don't fall away. Beware of beware of falling away from Christ and going back to the the, the temple sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's the that's the main message of Hebrews is don't fall away. Yeah. Because if you leave Christ, Christ is the he's the fulfillment of all these Old Testament um pictures. So what so what's the so that's the negative don't fall away. What's the uh like the thing or the evidence or what he's trying to give as to what will keep you from falling away? Christ is better. Okay. I mean he's he's setting forth Christ. Mm-hmm. Um so they're going back to the the Levitical priest. Yeah. Well, Christ is the fulfillment of the Levitical priest. They're they're all pointing forward to Him. Yeah. The animal sacrifices that that you're trusting in, um, they have no efficacy because Christ is the one to whom they all point. Um, and he, he just goes, goes through all on, all on, of on, these. Yeah. That the old covenant is passing away because Christ has brought in a new covenant, and it's better because it has better promises. Than yeah. the old covenant, yeah. Um, and so what he's doing is he's not, uh, you know, you just got to try harder. <laughs> you just you just got to be better, uh, you know, man up. He's putting forth Christ. Right. Um, he's he's giving them this vision of Christ, who is he is the ultimate. Um, he's the ultimate object of faith to which all of these these Old Testament. Um, types all these the the temple and the the sacrifices and the priest and and even these people all of them are pointing forward to Christ and so what he's doing to uh, to ensure that they persevere is say look who Jesus is look mm-hmm. at who Jesus is and follow him yeah good all right so I'll have you read you did uh, verses one through four oh, I'm gonna have you read that here in a sec but for the outline for those listening your outline kind of followed one thesis statement of you're like kind of you're trying to summarize what do verses one through four mean and you said something to this effect that we have a better revelation in jesus uh because of he is uh the supremacy of his person and the supremacy of his work Mm -hmm. is that right yeah we have a we have a superior revelation from god Mm -hmm. based upon a superior person and his superior work yeah yep Okay, so and that's kind of the structure that mm-hmm. you followed, yeah. and you can see it there. So um, could you read for us, and I'll shift over here uh, on the screen, Larry, and I'll have you read for us the passage. Yep. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. All right. Very good. Read like a true professional. I like that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, there's a but there. Uh, these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, and it does appear that there is an an emphasis on the superiority and maybe the finality mm-hmm. of what of how God reveals himself. Right. I think this plays into a lot of things. Uh, I mean, this could... I think it's applicable to a lot of issues that even go on today with yeah. continuationism and a lot of other Yeah, things. I agree. So let's talk about this. Long ago, how did God communicate before Jesus came? And then why is his revelation superior? And what we would say is 
I can explain it from my view of how I've kind of developed that theology from John's gospel, but the mm-hmm. finality of who he is. Right. Uh, and the supremacy of Christ's revelation and the finality of God's revelation in Christ. Well, how did God speak to his people? At many times in many ways. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I love how he opens this book. I mean, it's this epic opening that just stretches all the way back through mm-hmm. um, you know, thousands of years to how God has has at at various times he's communicated to his people. And so we can think of of uh you know, the visions that the prophets had or or Joseph's dreams. Um you've got uh the Lord appearing to Moses in a burning bush, uh, the the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Um, you, I mean, you just just name the ways, right? Right, in which God has revealed Himself to His people throughout the history of, well, I mean, stretching back to Adam mm-hmm. um, and how God has spoken to His people. It it can appear. Um, that if we were if we're to just think of it just in that way at first, that God's just speaking to everybody, right? But He's really not, right? He's not. He's not. Yeah. If you if you go back and look, He's not just. It's not this this open communication to everyone. Everyone. He always speaks by the prophets. Yeah. And uh, even you you go to to Exodus chapter twenty when God when they come to Mount Sinai and God does speak to all of Israel. He gives them the the Ten Commandments, and right after that, the people They're like, don't, say, don't tell don't Moses, let. "Don't don't let God talk to us anymore. Right. You talk to us. <laughs> don't let God talk to us, or we're gonna die." Yeah, God's too scary. Yeah, that, um, and so this this is the pattern: is this, that God doesn't he doesn't speak to the people in general. He always speaks through a prophet. Right. Yeah. People, and it's like Sproul said: the problem with people. The church and with people in general today is they don't know who God is, right? Yeah, and uh, that just reminded me of that because God's so great, the His immensity is so great, right? It, just who He is, His presence, that He's terrifying to a fallen person. Mm-hmm. Like fallen people don't encounter God, right? How do you know they don't? Well, because they're not terrified, yeah, out of their mind, right? And it's not that he's scary, like he's evil, evil scary, like some some something you'd see in like a scary movie, some grotesque creature that terrifies you. Mm. It's that the supremacy of his goodness is like the anti matter of, <laughs> of of your fallen nature. Yeah, right. We make little of God because we make little of our sin. Yeah. If we really understood how sinful we are, mm-hmm. um, we'd be terrified of God. Because he has no sin, um, he's he is he is pure, and he is holy, and um, and this this you know ties into this this contrast between how God spoke to the fathers. These would be Israel in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. and how he communicates to us in the New Testament. There's such a contrast, and part of it is the fact that God couldn't speak to the people in general because of their sin. Mm -hmm. So there had to be a mediator. Right. Right. So don't, don't speak to, don't let God speak to us because he's too scary because of who he is. We're going to die. So we got to have you. So you've got, you know, you got to feel bad for Moses, 80 year old Moses. He has to go up on the mountain and talk to God. Then he comes down and tells the people what God said. The people respond. So God has, to, or Moses has to go back up and talk to God. And he just goes up and down. And it, it just it highlights His, the distance between God and the people. Moses is a legendary hiker. That's right. <laughs> he must have an That's insane right. respiratory system. I guess so. He was probably yeah. immune to COVID. <laughs> Untouched. This guy's this guy's hiking. He's just got this huge chest. With... <laughs> so so the prophets, right? Th- right. This are a special group of people, and you know God is the initiator. If you look back through here, mm-hmm. like these people don't do witchcraft and then they conjure a, right. a, a, a manifestation of God. Mm-hmm. They don't do something. And they're often some meditative trance, and God appears. Like. God just appears to them. Yeah, he's the initiator. It's unexpected, right? Yeah. It's it's like uh, it's like Samuel in the temple as a boy. He's mm-hmm. he's laying down to go to sleep, and he hears he hears someone say, "Samuel, Samuel," 
he doesn't know who it is. He runs to Eli. He thinks Eli is calling to him, and right. and this happens several times. And then Eli, something clicks. He's like, "It's not me. It's not me. <laughs> There's someone else in this temple yeah. who's uh, who's calling to the boy." And so he he tells him how to respond mm -hmm. because it's God. Right. God is speaking to him. Yeah. Uh, God is God is in the temple, mm -hmm. and he is he's calling out, and it's unexpected. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Samuel wasn't expecting it. Eli wasn't expecting it. It just it just happens. Right? Yeah. Moses was not looking for God. God appears in yeah. a, a burning bush. Uh, Abraham right? God's looking. One, right. Yeah. Abraham's probably a pagan. He's a pagan. He's a, yeah. He's probably worshiping false idols, uh, false gods. So prophets. There's there's this emphasis on prophets, and then it's it, he says he's spoken to us by his son. So. Yeah. People may not begin to think about Jesus as a prophet. They may not, it, you know, that might not be their natural way of thinking about him. But mm -hmm. is Jesus a prophet? Absolutely, a prophet is someone who speaks to the people from God. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that um, Jesus is the ultimate prophet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't have time to to unpack everything in a sermon, but you can go back to Deuteronomy, yes, um, chapter eighteen. Um, the prophet is coming. Yeah, listen to him. Yeah, that's what Moses Moses says. And uh, when when Jesus appears, you, the the people say, which you know, the Mo Muslims say that uh, he's he's when uh, when Moses says that he's talking. He's talking about, about Muhammad, Muhammad, right? Muhammad uh -huh. Yeah, but he's not obviously. Right. There's a lot of reasons for that. When you continue to look at Moses's sermons, yeah, um, you even have themes of regeneration mm -hmm. and heart circumcision even back then. So he's obviously yeah. speaking about the new covenant, right? And it's interesting to think about prophets and to think about them at the beginning of John's Gospel. John the Baptist is the last Old Testament prophet. Uh -huh. We don't think about him that way. Right, because he's in the New Testament. He's cause, yeah, because he's in the New Testament, but he's an Old Testament prophet. Right. He's doing what the Old Testament prophets did. He just has more, more information, because right. he's closer there, so he can actually point where they're like, hey, there's coming someone, mm -hmm. and he's, it's, he, he's a shadow to us, right? We and it's, it's interesting, the, the religious leaders, they send some people to ask him who he is, and what's one of the things they ask him? Are you the prophet? Right. Right? That's right. <laughs> because they're anticipating yeah. this, this escalation uh -huh. that ends in, here's the ultimate prophet. Yeah. Um, and, and John, of course, says, no, I'm not the, I'm not the prophet. Yeah, um, but he comes. He he comes close close on his heels, yeah. right? Yeah, and the beginning of John's gospel too, the prologue. Mm -hmm. There's that. There's a very important. I don't know how would you would say this. Uh, Jesus is juxtaposed. Mm -hmm. Is that a correct? Term? Yeah, yeah. To Moses. To, to Moses uh -huh. at the very beginning, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Here's Moses. He he has prophesied. The prophet is coming. Right. Mm -hmm. Listen to him. And John is saying it's Jesus, right? When the law came through Moses. Jesus brought grace and truth. Yeah, right. Yeah, not saying that that Moses they're bringing separate types of of uh, ways to interact with God, right? But that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of this. Yeah. Um, and so there's this incompleteness to the Old Testament revelation. Yeah, it's it's shadowy, mm -hmm. um, and Jesus brings full light. So Moses, he's he's talking about Jesus, but it's in it's in types and shadows, right? Mm -hmm. Like how how can sinful man approach a holy God? Right. You have to come with a bloody sacrifice. Right. But goats and bulls, there's uh, there's a difference between you know the animals being sacrificed and me as a person. Mm -hmm. I've got to keep doing it over and over and over again. Um, but it's just this reminder that there has to be a, a blood sacrifice in order for God's wrath to be propitiated. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so you've got you've got this, it's there, right? They they should they should see it, um, but it's anticipating something greater. Um, so there there's this anticipatory element to the Old Testament revelation that's looking forward to fulfillment. Yeah, yeah. And so we have that supremacy of God's revelation. Mm -hmm. He he reveals exactly who God is. Yeah. And you brought out several points of this <coughs> from Jesus' life and ministry. Mm -hmm. If you want to know who God is, you look at Jesus. Yeah. He is the he is exactly like, like you don't have to wonder what is God like. Yeah. 
he reveals to him to us. He speaks to us. Uh, he is a supreme revelation. Hey, so you got long ago in these last days. Oh yeah, I know you want to talk about it, that. Yeah, in in various various times, various ways. Wait, now it's one, right? Was uh, it's the last days? So does that mean that Rome was pushing some type of uh, like a vaccine passport? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I couldn't resist. Josh. Right, the the mark of the beast. It's the sign of the right. last days. Uh huh. They couldn't travel Rome without a passport. Right. <laughs> No? Is that not what it means? No. Okay. No. <laughs> and I think we're we're we've been so we've been so um just immersed in this um uh, I'll just go ahead and say this dispensational theology mm -hmm. that is constantly looking for signs that are leading up to the last days. And the last days are the rapture and and you know the antichrist and all of these things mm -hmm. like that that's what i grew up thinking well we're not in the last days we're we're looking forward to the last days right and so you can even see you know people talking about the the vaccine mandate and things like that and they're saying oh we're you know we're we're approaching the end days right we're in we're in the end times the last days are here that's not New Testament, right? That's not Old Testament. <laughs> uh, the last days is a technical term, um, and it's looking forward to the days of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so you can look at, uh, I don't know if we want to look at all of these or not. Let's uh, just do a few of them. Uh, Numbers 24, uh, I will tell you what this people will do to your people in the last day. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, Balaam goes on to say, a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of, out of Israel. Mm-hmm. Like in the last days, this king is going to come, mm -hmm. um, and he's going to shatter Israel's enemies. Um, I love Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. The children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Mm. So what, what, is, what characterizes the last days? Wait, when was that written? Hosea? Yeah. Hosea was written before the Northern Kingdom fell to Assyria. Oh, I was so, just wondering, because the literalist way of reading right. everything, like, how are they going to come to David? I'm being a little facetious right, over right. here, George. Yeah. Right. These things, the way that these things are written, yeah. they'll come to David, meaning... They're looking forward to the greater David. Yes. Right? They're, they're not looking for a reincarnation the, yeah, of, of David's not King rise David. David's not going to from the dead. Right. It's they're looking forward to David's greater son. Yes, and and the prophets Ezekiel picks up on this. I think Isaiah picks up on it mm -hmm. that David is going to come. Yeah, they're not looking for the David that killed Goliath. Right. They're looking for David's son, who has been prophesied to be the Messiah, mm -hmm. who is going to be king forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Hosea says he's in the last there, days. he's going to come in the last days. Mm. Right, uh, Peter picks up on this when he's preaching his Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter two. He's taught, he's he's quoting from Joel, mm -hmm. but he says, "And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh." Peter is not saying we're still waiting. Yeah. Wait, wait for the last days. This is when it will happen. He's saying uh, yeah, now, yeah. now I'm I'm meaning, I'm explaining to you what has happened. And me and meaning by that, like not every single person, right? But people from all tribes, tongues, right. languages, and nations, the Gentiles. Right. You mean all doesn't mean all, Jay. Yeah. Those words, George. Right. Uh, then Jeremiah twenty three twenty. Mm -hmm. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the last days you will understand it clearly. Mm -hmm. So Jeremiah himself is saying, You're not going to understand everything that I'm saying mm -hmm. now. It's not until the last days that all of this is going to be made clear. Yeah. Why does why has it become clear? Because the Messiah comes and he brings with him the the fullness of revelation. Mm -hmm. Um so the prophets are talking about the coming of the Messiah, but Israel is not fully understanding what he's come to do, what he's going to look like until the last days. Yeah. And then now there's fullness of revelation. So the, the last days is just a technical term for the days when the Messiah comes, the days of fulfillment when all of God's God's promises, um, they come to a head with the coming of the Messiah mm -hmm. and his work. Yeah. So we have this superior revelation from God in Jesus. 
Now let's talk about uh, the supremacy or the superiority of his person. Right. And this is why the, the revelation is superior. Mm -hmm. It's because it's not just another prophet. Okay. It's not just an it's not it's not just another guy coming. Mm -hmm. The the person, the superiority of of the person and what he does means that this revelation is superior. Mm -hmm. And it also it also has implications for its finality, mm -hmm. for its sufficiency. If if this person is the fulfillment of all of these other things, like everything is leading up to him, then there's not something coming after him. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's no more revelation needed after him. Right. Um, so the, this would definitely be one of those passages I would I would go to when I was talking about continuationism. Right. Like are are these things still still happening? Is there are there prophets that are still giving new revelation? Right. Um, I would say no because mm -hmm. all of the revelation has been um, finalized mm -hmm. in in Christ. Right. Right. And so what comes, and we've talked about this in the John, when we talk about the Holy Spirit in John's gospel, that section back there, mm -hmm. um, that Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit would bring to remembrance his words. Yeah. Um, so what we see uh, as recorded in the gospels is a record of his life and ministry and works and his words. And then... According to that promise that Jesus gave. Yeah. And then what we have in the epistles and the other writings... Are there the apostles inspired by the Spirit? It's like an application, or implicate life implications and applications based off of Jesus, right? And also, and also, Jesus telling them, "I have a lot of things I want to tell you, but you're right. not you're not ready for you're it. You're not ready to." Hear but them when now. the Spirit comes, He will tell you things that are to come. And so, right. the New Testament is simply the it's simply the uh, the fulfillment of the promises that Jesus gave. Um, to the apostles, yeah, the apostles don't write about ethics, though, apart from right the examining the this world in yeah. light of who Jesus is mm -hmm. and what and he's so done. Anybody who says they have a revelation from God, you, you'll notice today they're they're always just like nonsense, random, dumb things. Right. I'm like, what does this have to do with living my life? And JMC life? and a pirate ship and yeah, there's yeah. sharks and what does it have to do, <laughs> you know, with me living my life in light of Jesus? Well, uh -huh. you can't improve upon what's already here. Right. You can't. What What else do you need? Right. Right. And that's what the author is is opening with. And all of these themes are going to be picked up as we go through the book. This yeah. these four verses are an intro to the rest of the book. Yeah. So we're we're gonna we're going to have this unpacked as we go along. Mm -hmm. Who is this Jesus? What has he done? Mm -hmm. Because he's just going to hit on it, and then and he's going to move on. But as we go along, I mean, chapter 10 is all about what he did. Um, and so we're, we're, just, we're just getting kind of the, the here's an overview right. of what we're going to be looking at. Um, and because of who he is and what he's done, the revelation is final. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> we can't go through every word and phrase here. Yeah, you want to go back and listen to the sermon, but let's let's hit on. I mean, there's eight. I, I can list the eight, and then we yeah, can go, go back to to what you want to. Yeah, and we can number them different ways. I had people coming up. Oh, we got seven. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it just depends on how you want to number it. There's, I mean, it's not inerrant <laughs> how I numbered it. Okay. Um, it's just a helpful way to kind of you know hooks to to put these on. Okay. So he's he's the one who has uh he's appointed the heir of all things. Mm -hmm. Um through him God created the world. Um he is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Mm -hmm. Um he has made purification for sins and he's set down at the right hand of the majesty on high and he's become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Okay. Yeah. So there's I, I numbered them as eight. Some people put um you know his purification and him sitting down as one um however you want to uh, to number it but hmm. Okay. Just just trying to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So it may be new to some people to to grasp this, I, I think understanding him as the heir of all things, most people would say, yeah, okay, yeah, I get that. That's kind of like what I've always been taught since I was little. Mm -hmm. But somehow people miss this one, that he created the world. I don't know how, <laughs> but it seems to be a pretty common one, Yeah, that they, they don't realize that Jesus made everything. Right. And we're going to talk about this more next week, 
um, as as we're looking at at Jesus's superiority to the angels. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he he is the creator of all things. That's that's John chapter one. Yeah, right. But nothing has been made apart from the Son. Yeah, uh, Colossians chapter one. Uh, all things were made by him. Uh, yeah, he he is the the one by whom through whom all things have been made. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, this goes back to you know how we're supposed to read our Bibles in in light of the fact that the Old Testament is is moving and and progressing and escalating and and f- is finalized in the New Testament. We read our Old Testament as Christians. So when you go back to Genesis one. Um, you need to understand that when God spoke, let there be light, he is speaking, the Father is speaking, and the Son, he's, he's creating through the Son um, by the Spirit. And so creation itself is Trinitarian. Hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so that's, I mean, we could, we'll save it for next time. Yeah, well, I mean, well, he's going to quote from some Old Testament passages right. that really emphasize who the Son is. Mm-hmm. Um, in his work as creator, right. he's not he's not just another creation. Mm-hmm. He is the eternal Son of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very important to to remember that thing about it. All right, how about how about this one then? The radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, imprint of his nature. He's God. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's I mean, there are certain phrases in the New Testament that you just stop and you. You just have to, to meditate upon it and let it sink in. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you think about, you know, don't go out and do it. You look at the sun in the sky and you, you stare at it. And what happens? Something you, physical, yeah, right? right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you're affected by it. Yeah. Um, you stare at the very center of the sun and it, it's so bright that it will blind you. Mm-hmm. This is what this is what the author is getting at. He is the very center of the glory of God. Right. He is the blinding beauty of of who God is. Yeah. Um, I, I, and so and so I, I you know, I was thinking about Exodus um, chapter thirty four or where Moses says, Show me your glory. Mm-hmm. And what happens? You've got God saying, I'll put you in the, the cleft of a rock, and I'll cover you with my hand, and I'll pass by. My glory will pass by, and then I'll remove my hand, and you'll see my back. Mm-hmm. Well, who is that? Yeah, that's Jesus. It's Jesus, right? Yeah. Show me your glory. I'll pass by you, and you can see my back. Right. But you can't see my face. Right. So Moses sees the back of Jesus. Yeah. He wants to see the glory of God. He sees the glory of God. Yeah. Right? But he only sees the back of him. Mm-hmm. Now, what's amazing for us is that in the New Testament, it's actually said that we see the face. Yeah, we see the face of of God. Yeah, we behold the glory we of God. Behold in the, face the of Christ. glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. So we're we're in a a superior it's in, position. It, the Moses, right? Moses saw the back of God, and his face glowed. We see the face of Christ, the glory of God, um, and the the. The glory is, um, it's far surpassing the glory yeah. of the Old Covenant. That's Second Corinthians chapter 30. Did you, were you able to look up the word radiance when you were doing your studies? Um, he's the, he is, um, oh goodness, I, I had it, but uh, I don't have it in front of me. You don't? No. It made me think of, um, there's a book on the Trinity. It's very, it's very uh, down-to-earth recommend it for anyone in the church by, um, oh, what is it? Michael Reeves? Mm-hmm. What is the name of that book? Delighting in the Trinity. Delighting in the Trinity. But in there, he used the, uh, he uses an illustration, I think it's an old one from church history of like a fountain. Mm-hmm. So it, it it's it's tough for people to grasp the eternality of the Trinity right. and what we understand as eternal generation. So right. let's talk about that for a second, okay. because this word made me cue on that thought of eternal generation, that the Son is the one who eternally proceeds from. He's eternally begotten, mm-hmm. meaning he is eternally generated from the Father. Right. Um, and so there's a, an old illustration of a fountain. Like, if you were to think of a fountain... Yeah. Like, you, 
none of these are perfect, but if you had an eternal fountain, mm -hmm. you have water that is eternally uh, generated. Right. And so when you, or you can think of it as like the sun. Mm -hmm. There's the sun, which emits radiance. And but you can't separate the radiance yeah. from the sun. And like you said, these all of these they are they're fraught with peril. Of course, <laughs> yes, of course. It's, yeah. it's just how so we're we're trying to we're trying to put to words something that is inexpressible. He is he's <clears throat> the glow. Yeah, I mean he is he is the burning brilliance of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. How has God chosen to glorify Himself? In his Through son. the Son, yeah, right. That's right. So this this is the supreme glorification of God. It's in the person of His Son. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, you can't. I mean, you, you can go to First John. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father, because the Father has chosen that this is how He reveals Himself, this is how He works, this is how He is, is glorified. It's in the Son. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you look at the Son, you are seeing the epitome and, and the, the ultimate manifestation of the glory of God. And it does play into how you read the Old Testament, too, because you begin to understand that, right, that's not the appearance of the Father in the Old Testament. Right. Right. The, the Father is not appearing, talking to people in the Old Testament, and then Jesus, they switch roles, and right. she's like, I got it from here, Dad. Right. You know, I got it from here. You know, this is what we agreed to before eternity. Yeah. The New Testament, that's that's where I uh -huh. reveal reveal who we are. Yeah, there's there's kind of this... Uh, this um, God, God in the Old Testament is this God of wrath, and God in the New Testament, Jesus comes and he he um, kind of appeases God because he's he's loving, and right. and this is kind of how they're they're they are um, they're at odds with each other, but the revelation of God in the Old Testament is through the Son. Right, it it's always through the Son that it, that is how God even reveals back, Himself. Even back to the Garden mm -hmm. where uh, Adam and Eve had the experience of walking in the Garden with God. Right. Well, who do you think's walking around in, in the garden? Right. Like, I think initially the way that we develop in our cultural understandings of this is we think it's the Father. Right. When in reality, Jesus is always been the way that God's glory is revealed. Mm -hmm. Always. Right. So they they were interacting with Jesus. <laughs> right. Well, he doesn't have that name yet because that's his human name. Yeah. Right. He's just Yahweh. They just He's call him Yahweh. Yahweh. Yes. yes. They just call him God. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's either known as the angel of the Lord, or they just call him God. Yes, or they just name him Yahweh. Mm -hmm. um, it's interchangeable mm -hmm. in in the person of the Son. Right. He shows up. I, this has been a major shift for me in the last couple of years. We often think the word of the Lord comes to a prophet, and we, at least for for me, I, I've always um, thought they're just hearing like this disembodied voice. That's I, I don't think that's what's going on. Right. Especially as John picks up the word of the Lord. Who is the word? There's actually someone coming to them and talking to them. Mm -hmm. Um I, I love I love how Moses um describes it in, in Genesis fifteen that that the word of the Lord comes to Abram in a vision. Mm -hmm. So you've got he's seeing something, but it's called the word. Like how do you see a word? Right. It's because the the person of the Son is being called the Word, and he appears to Abram in a vision. Mm -hmm. and a couple of verses later, it says that he took him outside. What is going on here? As Christians, we can understand this. We can understand there actually is someone there who's leading Abram outside. Yeah, um, he's he's following somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not the Father. It's not the Spirit. It's the Son. Mm -hmm. That's been a that's been like a paradigm shift. <laughs> For me and how I understand mm -hmm. what's going on, these are not these are not crazy people that are hearing voices in their head. They're seeing someone who's talking to them, mm -hmm. and they know who it is. It's Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so it's interesting. It's just cueing on those words made me think about all of those things. Yeah, it's very just interesting to think right. about. Right. Yeah, you just have to be really careful with those. I mean, the the this picture of the sun and the the 
you know, S U N, the the right. the glowing <laughs> glowing ball of gas, right. as the father and and the son is is like the of you course know, the, you the, can the, the the heat or the light like yeah. well now you've got now you've got um well, if, you yeah. know you've got you've got uh, Jesus as something that's being created and you got it, I mean it's well, just you, there's well, all you these you can separate them scientifically you can right. categorize these things and split them and yeah. make separation but I think the idea of what they're trying to illustrate is the idea of eternal generation right when we don't have a way he has eternally begotten the son right now what is that I mean what does that mean well that that's where we're getting into well, we you know, the transcendence of God. We the problem with it is we don't have a way to illustrate it. Right. But we try to come up with ways to where we can at least begin to grasp a little bit of that. Right. Uh there's no and this is why when the Bible says God is holy holy holy. Mhm. Like it, it's beyond just more mere moral perfection. Right. We understand the idea of moral perfection. Yeah. But what we're talking about in God is someone who who is Eternally, three persons. Yeah, there's one God that's eternally exists in three persons, and he and he is as God is like nothing mm-hmm. in all of creation. <laughs> right. So there's no way to illustrate him. Yeah. You can't do it. Yep. And so you you know you try, but if you stretch it too far, then you become a heretic. And God God right. has revealed Himself as as Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, he's the eternal Son. He's the eternal Father. So before there was any creation, God was still the Father, the Son, mm-hmm. and the Spirit. Um, the Son is begotten of the Father, um, not the the, not early, the early church creeds. He's not made, begotten, but not made, begotten. Yeah. Um, the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, um, and that's that's as far as we can go. I mean, what does that even mean? Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about not just. Not God, and you you said it in a, in a sermon one time that that God is not just the greatest of all beings; He is infinitely greater than all beings. Mm-hmm. So He's there is an infinite space between God and His creation, mm-hmm. and so we we're not going to be able to to fully comprehend this God. We we have to <clears throat> simply stick with the how he's revealed himself. Yeah, we can't even understand how covid actually spreads. Right. <laughs> so let's uh let's realize we're not going to grasp the infinite. Our fallen world can't supremacy. even tell you when life begins in the womb. <laughs> 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 They're not going to be able to uh we're not going to be able to to fully communicate yeah. you know this infinite god. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Exact imprint of his nature. This right. this was uh, this one's easy to grasp. You know, everyone in that day would see a Roman coin, right. and the the uh, there'd be an imprint of the image of Caesar on the coin. Mm-hmm. And we have it today. You can. Do, do people still carry change? Very few. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very few, especially now. Yeah, it's got germs on it, and so everything is. Uh, it's it didn't have germs list. before. It just has yeah. germs now. It's got grody germs. <laughs> So you know you got the imprint on there, right? Uh, George Washington. Yeah, you can see that, and so he is the exact image of. Right. If you want an image, like I need an image. <laughs> yeah. It makes you wonder, right? Like, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to talk about commandment violations. But okay. Yeah. But like, th- but Philip, he he says, just show us the Father, and it will be enough. Right. And Jesus says, Have I not been with you? <laughs> All these, all these years. Yeah, yeah. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Yeah, it's mind blowing. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he is the exact imprint of God's nature. Maybe there's a little something more to the image of God in humans. Yeah. Than simply we're relational beings, George. Yeah. Right. Right. May, maybe it's more literal than we ever thought. <laughs> And again, we have to be real careful, right? Of course, of course, <laughs> of course, we do. But but again, um, Jesus is the one who has become incarnate, right? Not the Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. We don't understand why these things are, right? But He does say, "If you've seen Me and you see things with eyes, yeah. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father." Right. God, God didn't just accidentally make us bipeds, right? Like we don't just stand on two. Two legs by accident. Humans are uh, regal. Mm-hmm. 
we're regal compared to other creatures. I don't right. know how else to say it. The supremacy between us and, some and, more than others. I mean, any other any other creature on the face of the earth, right. there there is like a, the gap is like right. I, I, it's so far greater. Like people are impressed that chimpanzees can can <laughs> learn like like uh, like two hundred words. I'm like, that's cool. My hunting dog can also learn but like two hundred <laughs> words. You know what I mean? But you're also watching these chimpanzees in a cage. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Like there's like, no there's uh, yeah. You, and they eat their own children. Right. Or or a competing male will eat the uh-huh. other male's children. Right. All there's, kind of weird, gross stuff. There is a there's a definite uniqueness to we stand, humanity. Yeah, we you, stand on you two can't, feet. You can't miss it. We're dignified. We stand mm. on two feet create art chimpanzees aren't uh sitting here making podcasts they're not pon- they're not pondering they're not pondering uh the imponderable right right or they're, they're not sitting around talking about the trinity or their own finiteness right you know yeah no right. um <laughs> and for yeah. so when he says that though you think about it jesus says, anyone has seen me they've seen the father mm-hmm. that's never going to change yeah like through eternity right in the new heaven and the earth we don't know what all that'll be like, but if you want to walk up and talk to God, make an appointment. I don't know. What's the? <laughs> what's the? Does a wait time even matter if you've got e- e- uh, eternity? Uh-huh. But you get to go. Uh, yeah. Do you get to hang out with Jesus and talk to him? I think. I think probably. How does it all work? Don't know. I mean, but... the, the spirit is not going to leave us in the eternal state. The right. spirit is always going to indwell us. Right. Um, we're we're always we're eternally going to be in union with Christ, and that's mm-hmm. through the Spirit. Um, so the Spirit won't leave us in the mm-hmm. eternal state. Right. But I'm just saying. Right. Do you want to see God? Uh huh. Hey, go see Jesus. Right. You look at Jesus. There he is. And how? So then, uh, then again, this would tie back in. Do you want to know what God is like? Mm-hmm. Well, you don't need to go to some mountaintop, you know, and pop a couple of shrooms. Right, and then and then get get a. Did you ever watch that? Get did a DMT ever, trip. Going. Did you ever watch that Russell Crowe Noah movie? Yeah, a long time. Yeah, I saw that with one Meth- time, yeah. Methuselah. He goes and sees Anthony Hopkins Methuselah, and Methuselah is like this guy who's like high on some kind of weird. <laughs> weird he's on psych- He's on psychedelics. That's how he. That's how he uh, communicates with God is. Yeah. Is through drugs, right? Yeah. That's not no DMT trips required here, right? You just open the Bible. It's up Jesus, and, and right? You, and you study and you learn learn of Jesus. And Look then to you Jesus, to, right? And then, then you know, if you become a Christian, then you're indwelt by the Spirit, mm-hmm. and you have this connection with God, right? A, a real one. That that word imprint, it's um, it's the Greek word character. Mm-hmm. He's the character of the essence of God. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you look at Jesus, when you see Jesus, when you you see how Jesus acted, his how he related to humanity, that's God. Mm-hmm. That's how God. That's how God um, relates to fallen creatures. Yeah, it's it's been it's been utterly manifested to us um, in the person of Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Okay, man, we're going long, aren't we? Upholding the universe by the word of his power. Very yeah. simple concept to understand that uh, the universe does not simply just exist. Right. Right. It, it's not. It's not a clockwork put in motion by God that can just run on its own energy. Yeah, it's not. He's not the deist, the yeah. deist God where the, it's the clockmaker. He he winds up the clock and sets it in the motion, and then he goes and he doesn't have any interaction with it this this i think um should really expand our view of providence Mm -hmm. that that the world we we get so we're it's like you said we're we have been so influenced by this materialistic um view of of the world that we forget how supernatural it is Mm -hmm. and so we we think about all these laws of of nature like gravity and we're we're held down to this earth because of gravity. Right. Well, behind that is the Son of God, who is making sure you don't fly off, you know, to Neptune. Mm-hmm. Um, he upholds everything. The all the science of how how the earth is held together, and we've got a core, and and it, it all is is held together, and we we orbit the sun because of the sun's gravitational pull and and all of these things if the sun did not uphold these things the universe would fly apart mm-hmm. um laws of nature right or not um it's the sun 
who is upholding these things by the word of his power, mm -hmm. right? That's that's Genesis. That's creation language. Mm -hmm. like he he creates by his word and he upholds mm -hmm. by his word. And he's a God who is he's intimately um, acting within his his creation, right? Even today, mm -hmm. um, and so all of history is is happening under the the divine providential hand of of Christ, right? Right, yeah. and. Um, that that word, the universe, it's it's the Greek word, everything, yeah, all things. Right. So everything. he upholds all the things uh, by the word of his power, mm -hmm. and so this would be even more than just the things that we see. It's the things that we don't see. Mm -hmm. um, it's even the flow of history. He's upholding these things by the word of his power, mm -hmm. and so there's no chaos um, ultimately because of Christ. Mm -hmm. This is the timeline. That's right. There is no, there's, there's no, no deviance. There's no deviant. Right. There's no alternate timelines. Yeah. There's not a, there's not a multiverse. Yeah. If there is a multiverse, it existed in God's mind. Oh, he could see every multiverse. Right. That's how great and infinite he is. Uh -huh. Even beyond yeah. that. There's no, there's no uh, alternate J's and George's. Well, this but, I mean this this is this is a little fun <laughs> sidebar, you know. When, I'm, when I was researching in the uh, problem of evil, uh -huh. you know, the kind of the where I concluded based off of Colossians one sixteen, that all things are made through by Him or and for Him, right? Is that um, God has the capacity, of course, to know everything before He's ever created anything, right? And why does this universe exist? Well, this universe exists because this is the one to where. Christ receives the most glory. Yeah, I like, uh, you know, John Piper, he calls himself a seven-point Calvinist, mm -hmm. and I, I like, his, uh, I like his, his seven points, but one of those points is uh, this is the best of all possible worlds. Not for the reasons you think it is, though. Right, that's, because this, this is, the, this is the, the world in which God is most, most glorified. Yeah. That may we may have skipped a few points. The, the The deal that they usually say is, if God is all powerful, He can do anything. Mm -hmm. Why are evil and suffering exist? He could make a world with free creatures where they never choose evil. There's no pain and suffering. And yeah. the answer is, of course, He could. Right. He could do whatever He wants. Uh -huh. But this is the world in which He gets the most glory. Right. And so, just deal with it. <laughs> You're not. If you're, you're ever going the J hey, J shocker. in the counseling room, yeah. shocker. <laughs> Just deal you're, with it. <laughs> you're not the center of the universe. Shocker. Right. You should have known that the second you opened your eyes. Yeah. Right. It's about God. Yeah. And, but we don't like that because we're fallen. Yes. Exactly. Um, and sin is is um, not it. We fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. We don't want God's glory. We want ours, and that that comes out even in our grumblings over. The type of world in which we live, right? Yeah. So yeah. Jay's advice is, deal with it. Deal with it. Yeah. yeah. Deal with it. I mean, Jesus offers you eternal life. You're going to suffer for. <laughs> well, I mean, even if your life is terrible, you have the most terrible life of any person that's ever lived. Say you live in a gulag. Right. Uh, Christ gives you eternal life. Right. Yeah. This is a momentary thing. Right. It's a light momentary it's affliction. Nothing. It's nothing. We just can't. We can't grasp the. Uh, what in eternity is like? Yeah, in eternity of paradise, right, with God. But all of this is upheld by the the word of His power. It is, yeah. Right. And so, after making purification for sins, He sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. Okay, so two two things here. Uh, there is first off an actual a uh, an actual atonement. Right. Okay? We'll hit this much later. Oh yeah, uh, in great detail. But let's just say. Right up front, you can say he does not make a potential purification for sins. Right. He's actually done something. He's made purification for sins. Yeah. Past tense, right? Yep. And because he's actually accomplished something, he sat down. Right. Telling us he actually definitively did something. Yeah. And what he's done, he's done doing, so he sits down. Yeah. That's. I mean, it's often missed, mm -hmm. and, and we'll hit on it. I mean, like you said, it's... When we get to it, it's very pronounced, mm -hmm. this idea that he sat down, mm -hmm. because um, that's not something that the, the Levitical priest did. 
I mean, you go back to Exodus, you, you look at the second half of the book of Exodus, there's all these, these instructions for how to build the, the tabernacle and all the, the instruments and everything that's supposed to be in it, and it's supposed to be to these exact um, specifications. Um, God revealed these things, and Moses couldn't you know, tweak them and, and make them different. All of these things. What did God not tell Moses to make? No chairs. Chairs. There's no chairs, because the priests are constantly They're working. Working. Um, and so the fact that Christ sits down after he's done, that has this, this massive implication, don't overlook it, that he sat down. That's a theological statement. Mm -hmm. He sat down because he's done. He has accomplished the purpose for which God has sent him into the world. Yes, which was to atone for sin. Atone for sin. Yeah. It's actually, he actually did it. Yeah, right. Um, right. When he said, when he said to die, when he said it, it is finished, <clears throat> that's not just some, you know battle cry mm -hmm. he actually meant it mm -hmm. like it's done right um the, the that that word to tell us it's in the the past perfect meaning it has been and will forever be finished um and uh i was i i mentioned this in the intro and i was talking about this um more with my wife after uh when we were at lunch on sunday that i think that the book of hebrews demolishes roman catholicism mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't know how, how you can read the book of Hebrews and still go to Mass, unless you just don't understand what the Mass is. But if you read the, 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 the teachings of the Catholic Church, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they, they hold that when the, the priest does his you know, hocus-pocus, and we talked about uh, you know, a month ago, he actually is, is pulling Christ down from heaven, right, and the the uh, the bread and the wine is becoming yeah, they, the they body believe, and blood. It's a bloodless sacrifice. They believe that they re-sacrifice Jesus on, yeah. on the altar, right? So it's it's this continual. So you know, however many thousands and thousands of Catholic churches, whenever they do mass, they believe that they're they're performing the sacrifice. That's not what the Book of Hebrews says. Right, it says that he actually made atonement. He actually made purification for sins, and he sat down. Right. And when we get to, to chapters 9 and 10, it becomes very clear that he did this once for all. He, he does not, he's not sacrificed over and over again. The, the author is even going to say if this, didn't, if this didn't work, he would have had to have come, kept doing this, but he did it once for all. Man, we are such, uh, I don't know if cowards, maybe cowards is the right word. And I mean, when I say we, I mean like um, Protestant Christians in general. Yeah. Compared to our uh, the people who have gone before us, yeah, I remember reading William C. Burns, his uh, diaries, and he was in, I think he was in Ireland. Mm -hmm. You know the Catholic stronghold that place is. Right. So William C. Burns uh, on the main the mainland, there was a big revival that broke out, but I guess you know there's a lot of attention. He didn't like that, so he's like, I got to keep moving, and so he he got. <laughs> This guy goes outside, Catholic mass gets out, this guy's out there open air preaching to these people, and they try to stab him and kill him. Hmm. Yeah. That's the people that we have, like we stand on these people's shoulders. Right. Like these are these these guys legitly believed this. Yeah. And they weren't ashamed of it. Right. We got people now, you know, my friend Robert and his issues he had with his church recently, the DOM got involved. Yeah. Our denomination is messed up. Well, <laughs> yes. pro probably not about to be our denomination long, much longer. But just to tell you, like the DOMs in general, the ones I've met, there's a big problem. And so this this guy takes him to lunch, and he introduces this lawyer to help you know to help him mediate this stuff. <laughs> yeah. As uh, he's he's a Roman Catholic, and he tells Robert, you know, it's good he's working with us because he's a brother. He's a brother of ours, and <laughs> right. he's, he's he's a brother with us. And yeah. Robert was a Roman Catholic, mm. and so of course Robert is like majorly triggered. Because he left Roman Catholicism yeah. to actually follow right. Christ in, uh, as according to the Scriptures. But we've got people who are ashamed and scared to say what truth is. Right. Meanwhile, our forefathers are willing to get stabbed to death for it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, we talked about this you know, several weeks ago when we were talking about churches firing their their uh, their pastors over Calvinism and and how I had a lot of people accusing me of of teaching Catholicism because <laughs> we were bring, crazy because because Julia was teaching catechism class for the for the children on Wednesday nights and they thought they hear catechism and they immediately think Roman Catholic mm -hmm. 
Um, and so they would, I mean, I had people that were calling it, um, uh, Catholicism, like trying to, <laughs> trying to bring it together. And it's really offensive because, um, I, I denounce Roman Catholicism. Right. Like I, I don't, I don't just think that it's a branch of Christianity. I think it's a cult. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it's pagan. And I think if you follow the Roman Catholic doctrines that the, the Roman Catholic church is anathema. Mm -hmm. Um, and so to try to, to bring that in and say, ah, oh, these Calvinists are bringing in Catholic teaching. Like, you don't understand either one of those, mm -hmm. either one of those things. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just so bizarre. It's just so bizarre. I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't looking for this, but um, the, uh, like the, I don't know, I think it was the the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, like the, the denomination, I mean, we call it a denomination. Now the church that John Knox mm -hmm. started, they actually posted something um, on Facebook just this last week saying we denounce um, sectarianism and division. We stand with our Roman Catholic um, brothers. They made like this long statement about how they were in constant communication with Roman Catholics and like John Knox would be busting some heads like, you know, <laughs> over, over this. Like this is not what the Protestants stood for. They right. stood they stood for these doctrines that are um, in direct opposition to the Roman Catholic teachings. Yeah. And we and we this doesn't mean that we need to go out and you know start fights with Roman Catholics, but it does mean that we need to view it correctly. Mm -hmm. that if they're following the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, they are not brothers in Christ. Yeah, was it was it uh, the first Marian martyr? Uh, I've used that illustration several times. Was it John Smith? What was his name? I can't remember now. But, I mean, the, the issue was his denouncing the Catholic Church, right. that taking communion mm -hmm. uh, was receiving... Christ in His and we body need, and blood, yeah, and, and we it, need to, and it was, and we need to make sure that we we separate this because I think a lot of Baptists they 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 see what the Catholics are doing in the Mass and they're saying, oh, well, they're just taking the Lord's Supper, it's right. just like us. They've got no. some minor differences. Uh -huh. No, this is a Mass. They actually believe that this is a sacrifice. They're they're bringing Christ down. They're sacrificing Him again. You have to take it. This is this is um, a, a mode of grace. Like you take it and you receive grace. Um, and he, in, in itself, in the yeah. elements, because it's the body and blood, that is not what That's a Baptist church is doing. Well, whatever your position yeah. on it in the Baptist church is, um, you that's, not, that's not the Roman Catholic. They, they are doing something absolutely different. And, they're re and, that, and that is rece they receive grace, the grace of God in that fashion. Yeah, yeah. And so for that one thing alone about uh -huh. communion, he was willing to be burned to death. Yeah. And they burned him to death in front of his whole church and in front of his whole town. And now we have a an associate an association of Southern Baptists that have right. a night of unity, a prayer meeting, a, a you know time of quote unquote worship yeah. with Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, it's just blasphemy, and it it you know just read the book of Hebrews. Yes, yeah, that's kind of a you know side, yeah. a side note, but it's it's so important because we you can you can look up you can look up stories of Protestants, even Southern Baptists who have left, they've left the faith, they have fallen away and they've gone to Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people in the Roman Catholic Church that don't even understand that doctrine. Right. And they may even be, uh, God through His grace uh, may have called them out as they heard as they heard of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. He may have called them out to salvation. Yeah. And they may be there not knowing yeah. exactly what is being taught. Right. And I think you do see it going in the other order mm -hmm. that as they do learn, they eventually will leave. Right. Um, so they're so they're there. We can't say a hundred percent. You know, everybody there right. believes this and knows this because yeah. they, they just don't. But the institution right. itself, mm -hmm. the institution itself, yeah. the priests, they're without uh -huh. excuse. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. But what we need is uh, we need to 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 gain this vision of Christ. We need the vision of Christ that that the author of Hebrews. Um, is going to present to us mm -hmm. in these thirteen chapters, and and as you as you see Christ more clearly, that's going to keep you from falling away. It's, right. it's going to cause you to persevere because you're gonna you're gonna look at Jesus and you're gonna say, He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of His nature. Why would I want to go anywhere else?
Um, I'm, I'm willing to be thrown into prison and to have all my stuff taken away and to even die for this Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. That's right. So last thing, i got to shut it down, but tell us the last, the last little phrase here. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than yeah. theirs. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's, uh, that's the author's favorite word, superior. Mm -hmm. um, it's the word that can be translated as better. Um, it's found 19 times in the New Testament. It's found 13 times in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. So he loves that, uh, he loves that word. Yeah. The root word is actually kratos. Mm. You know what kratos means? Better? Mighty okay. or strong. Mm. So he's, he's stronger. He's, 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 he's superior. I mean, that, that word, it, I mean, I, I, I love the, that translation, superior. Mm -hmm. um, he, becomes, he, he is made superior to the angels. Now we have, to, we have to remember, he's not talking about Jesus in his eternal state. So Jesus, as the eternal Son of God, does not become superior to angels, but in his humanity, in his incarnation, right. through his suffering, the God-man, the Messiah, is exalted right. um, in, his, uh, in his resurrection and his ascension. Right. He has been made superior to angels as he has inherited a, a name that's better than the angels. Mm -hmm. And that name has been disputed. Right. Um, commentaries discuss it. I think the next verse, I think the context um, tells you what that name is. Mm -hmm. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Right. The angels do not inherit that name. Mm -hmm. Only Jesus does. He is the son of God. Yeah. So and this is Philippians 2. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Philippians and then, 2. Yeah. And then also, um, we become adopted sons and daughters. Uh-huh. Yeah. We're brought into God's family. And so him. we're not, when you die, you don't become an angel. Yeah. Why would you want to settle for being an angel right. when you die? Yeah, <laughs> you've been adopted. You are a son. You are you are going to be superior to the angels. And Paul even tells us that we're going to judge angels. Yeah, mm -hmm. wrap your mind around that one, Jay. Okay, I will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening today. Hopefully, it's uh, beneficial. Been a long one, but it was good. Good to get in here and uh, talk about this stuff. Excited for the rest of the book. Hopefully this has been beneficial to you and helpful to you. If our podcast is, please give us a like, subscribe, share, and you can write a review when you write a review that helps other people to find us and discover us. It's our hope and our desire that you know, everything we do and everything we talk about on here will help you to become more and more conformed to Christ.